Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And Kishore from Tested. And we are still here at Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab, uh, learning about how researchers are using virtual reality to learn some interesting things about human behavior. The psychology uh, of human behavior. The psychology of human behavior in VR. Uh, this demo we're going to do today um, does some interesting things with your sense of body and your awareness of your body. Yeah, so much of the stuff we've seen in VR has been humanoid representations of yourself. You might be in a different setting altogether, but you're still two arms, two legs, humanoid body, humanoid shape. Now, what if we start to inhabit non-humanoid bodies? Could we take you and add a limb? Could we mess with your legs and still be functional? Because what we're really looking at here is, is the psychology, is your brain plastic enough to actually handle it? I actually don't know. I'm gonna be really interested, especially for somebody like you, who spent a lot of time in VR to see if it actually works or not. Can't wait to get this demo. Let's get to it. So I'm here at Sanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. Andrea, we just ran through a couple of demos. You guys are doing all sorts of interesting demos for research purposes using virtual reality. And I want to talk about this demo experience. What's, what's the demo called? What are you guys calling this one? So we call this the third arm demo for clear reasons because it has a third arm coming out of your chest. And what is the point of trying to test someone to see what you can do with a third arm? In virtual reality. So this is a, is a follow-up to the first experiment where we just wanted to see if when you change the way people's actions are represented in, in virtual reality, can people adapt to that so that they can do um, whatever it takes to complete the task the best. So can you get people to use their legs instead of their arms to hit targets? We found out that people would adapt really quickly. This experiment was designed to see if we could create an avatar where people had um, more capabilities than they did do in real life. So what we were comparing is people's ability to hit targets close to them and then step forward and hit a target that was a little further away and compare that to if people could learn to control an extension that came out of their chest, if they could actually surpass their performance in their normal body and learn to control an avatar body that gave them control of more space. There seems to be like a understanding or at least belief in the at least VR development community that positional tracking is the rule of law. You need perfect positional tracking of your head or your hands to have these kind of experiences be convincing, to give you a sense of, sense of uh, your the user a sense of mm -hmm. presence. Um, are you, is this demo kind of to illustrate that maybe you can have some differences in the tracking or give the user you know, something that doesn't actually represent what their own body is and have a difference between the visual and your sense of body and still have it be believable? Yeah, so what we're trying to look at here is, is in a lot of, vir as you know, a lot of virtual reality experiments uh, look at this, is when you break the relationship between what you're doing and what you see yourself doing, or what you're doing and how you see your, your, your self represented, what happens? So this one is is breaking that link to give you a body that has um, that is more functional for the specific task than your normal body. So uh, I think that uh, when you talk about uh, tracking, it's like we're always pursuing better tracking, right? So this is so one of the things that that our lab does is not particularly pit technology against itself, but just say, given what we have now, what questions can we answer? Mm -hmm. And this one, we're um, looking to see, given current technology, what can people adapt to? Right, and even if a technology has this level of tracking and that's good enough for some sort of experience, you're also allowing, you're exploring the idea of what, if you break that rule, if you intentionally break the rule, or you want to augment the movements of a hand, like you can still have an interesting experience that is compelling in the virtual space. That's right, and I think it's interesting when you look at um, at this experiment, especially since we're now at this point where there's been all this these exciting advances in how things are tracked, um, how much we've been able to do with with um, tracking that is is less than ideal, right? And I think it, it kind of it goes back to this idea that um, we don't have a very good ability to override the visual information that we receive in, in VR. So you can, when you're in virtual reality and you get this visual information that something happens when you move your hand, even if it's clunky, it's hard for you to completely ignore that and not be affected by mm -hmm. it. So I think um, we're at an interesting point now where we might see as people get more experience with virtual reality where they're able to um, be more suspicious of, of the information they're getting in the headset. But 
we haven't had that level of sophistication in users yeah, before, Yeah, there, right? there are two so, points there that are super interesting. The visual, the idea that the visual information can override any inadequacies and your brain can fill in for the the, tech, the, uh, te the technology even. Um, mm -hmm. In the demo, the first demo I use where you have uh, your leg movement uh, exaggerated. If I move my leg a little bit, it's tracked so many degrees, but you're visually representing my leg moving very higher up. Mm -hmm. Over time, my brain felt that I was actually moving my Making leg higher high up. Yeah, and so you, there are applications maybe as people are developing virtual reality software to have less actual physical strain because it's relative physical strain to the software and the visual can compensate. So one thing that's, that I think is a really interesting application for that is in the healthcare arena because there's a lot of um, times when people have uh, injuries or chronic condi conditions where it might be advantageous to show them moving more freely um, than they really are moving or conversely to show them that they're, uh, to give them the impression that they're not moving past a point where they might be guarding. So it mm. gives us a really interesting opportunity to manipulate how people see their bodies and see if you can use that to help people that, that have a problem. Another interesting thing I think you mentioned is as you're seeing a whole spectrum of users um, from people who've tried VR for the very first time or haven't had any degree of positionally tracked VR experiences to people who've used all sorts of the whole you know, mm -hmm. VR experiences, how does that affect the results of the research you're doing and that's what are the gonna, implications of that? That's going to be so interesting. So I think maybe um, an analogy that we can think of is when you think about uh, people, moviegoers now. So it's like um, because we're exposed to, to television and film, it's like we get very sophisticated at a very young age. So you can never bring somebody in the lab that's a naive, you know, that's never seen something represented on the screen. So mm -hmm. it's like we come in very sophisticated, you know, with very sophisticated about the media. Um, but virtual reality, we, in the past, we've been working with people that they, people might run through a few experiments in the lab or they might have a tour, but they're, they're, it would be very uncommon to have somebody come in such as yourself who has lots of experience in all kinds of different virtual reality platforms. That's what it was like when I started five years ago, but that may not be uh, what it's going to be like in five years. So you might have people come in uh, that have a kind of a grammar of what virtual reality experiences look like that will be used to the idea that, oh, maybe I only have floating hands or maybe I expect uh, my avatar to have my skin texture. So I think that that's a really interesting unknown. It's like, what will happen as users get more sophisticated and how will that affect the experiments we can do? Yeah, it's, uh, for your movie analogy, we're still at the train coming at the screen part I, of it. I think we're so. We're not at telling stories, fast cuts. We're not at, you know, 3D environments, 3D worlds. Like there's a whole you know, century of that, of VR experiences to come. From a research perspective then, do you have to stay ahead of that? Well, I think what's happening in the culture also drives research, right? Um, so we're, what we want is to, this is a pretty fundamental exper experiment because it's looking at um, how the visual overrides uh, what, you're, what you're actually uh, doing moving. But what we got are starting to get into too is that does it matter how these things, um, how, how our avatars look and what, um, what are we pulling from our, our expectations about media representation anyway? So one thing we talked about um, in the, um, the experiment where yeah, you switch the arms and legs, mm -hmm. and we talked about how in that um, avatar, um, it was a very stiff-armed motion, right? We didn't have any inverse kinematics. So you didn't have elbows or knees. Uh, but people seemed less troubled by it. And one idea was maybe it's because that avatar looked kind of silver and robot -y. So maybe what people were kind of bringing in their expectations, this is a representation of me and I'm going to change my behavior accordingly. But it's definitely not a real human body because it's silver. So I'm not going to be as weirded out by the lack of, 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 of arm and leg movement. Uh -huh. So that's an interesting question. I mean, if people are experiencing in video games that probably affects their experience too so right and representation and cues can compensate for some of that right and also people they they change their ex expectations once they're in for a few moments so they sure they, they adapt to it rather quickly yeah and we're very good at, at adapting um, to media what I think doesn't change is that when you have a mediated experience you try to understand it given your experience up to that point, but a lot of the ways you react to things are based on these uh, very basic um, 
instinctive unconscious reactions. Like I said, when you move your hand and you see something move, it's very hard to, to disassociate that from your hand in some way. So you might feel protective of it. You might feel a certain sense of agency over it. So there's these automatic responses. But overlaid on that is, is whatever you know about virtual reality and whatever you know about media in general. And well, that's, that's really, really interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting time. Awesome. Thank you so much for chatting with me. It's a pleasure. You were a pro with that third limb, like right away. Yeah, it was no problem at all. Uh, as I talked to Andrew about, it really felt like puppeteering. Uh, now, the technology they're using, as with all the demos they're using, it doesn't need to be the most cutting edge hardware. You know, they're tracking your wrist, but it's only three degrees of tracking. They're, and you don't have the roll motion. And for me, for someone who's used, you know, the HTC Vive, even Oculus Touch, where you have the six degrees of tracking, uh, that lack of tracking fidelity actually made the demo experience, I felt a little more distant from it. They actually have an upcoming project that's gonna be five limbs coming up and there's three degrees of motion on each of those limbs. So the com the quantitative sort of measures are gonna go up exponentially. The experiment you did is really based off an old thing that uh, Jaron Lanier, one of the pioneers of VR did, where he basically created a VR demo where you inhabit a lobster, mm. but not a human as a lobster, you're the lobster and you have to work as a lobster. What's really interesting to me is how quickly you adapted to that situation. The applications thereof are, are pretty massive. If we can increase the tracking, which is a hardware problem, yeah. pretty simple to solve given yeah. the trajectory of everything. Maybe now we could have doctors using multiple hands in a surgery if that's right. connected to like a robotic um, endpoint. There's really some interesting things I was just still shocked at how quickly you picked it up because it was much harder for me. The brain really is that plastic. And I think having the task at hand, knowing the parameters, knowing the rules of it, you can approach it like a game. They designed it like a game. I'm popping balloons or touching the white cube. And so once I know, okay, if my goal is to just hit the white cubes, they're not asking me to hold chopsticks with my third hand. Then I can just maximize how I'm splitting my brain, multitasking, to then capitalize on that movement of, of this phantom limb. Think about it this way, which I think is the interesting thing. We've played so many games that are based on humanoid characteristics. Now we can start talking about VR games where you inhabit a non-humanoid, where you really embody characteristics that you just couldn't even imagine years ago. And I'm looking forward to those games because some of my favorite 2D games are those sort of alien creatures and characters. And as Andrew is saying, if you're inhabiting an avatar that you know that the designer consciously tells you it's you're not supposed to be human it can even be a robot mm -hmm. with limbs then your expectations actually allow you to compensate for some of the technological limitations of that tracking system of the fidelity of of the degrees of motion um, what i really liked is the demo where uh they were augmenting my motions you know i couldn't see where mm -hmm. my real leg was in real time but the visual indicator is so strong that did it feel natural it felt so natural i felt like even though my legs were kicking up a foot or two mm -hmm. as long as in in the vr space my virtual leg was doing these high kicks like you're not going to need to design martial arts games to ask someone to actually do these crazy moves you, you know can just I ask show it to them i wanted to go for like a run on on the moon like the astronauts yes. did, like you could really simulate that condition now yeah. in, in a way that's realistic based on seeing something like that. And do you feel like that it kind of lingered afterwards, that you Definitely. felt like, oh yeah, I, I feel like I have more sort of capability with that kind of stuff, like more agency with it. Uh, absolutely, and it's one of those things, even with simulators like exercise simulators or for sports, you know, adding all these visual cues and augmenting your experience, making you run maybe in the game faster than you actually would in real life on a treadmill, mm -hmm. like all these things actually help and, and make that experience not only more immersive, but more fun to be in. Yeah. I guess if Drago had this, he would have beat Rocky. Yeah. But maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots of cool stuff from Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. We want to thank the researchers for inviting us here today to check out these demos. Uh, you can go to their website to learn a whole lot more. All of their publications are up there, especially for those that are VR fans that really want to see where the research is going. Uh, but I will just emphasize, research is still really far behind where the hardware is yeah. right now. So I think the years to come for this is going to really deliver some interesting results. Awesome. We can't wait for that. Thank you, Kishore. And thank you guys for watching. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like this video, and we'll see you later.